So a lot of discussion these days about the cost of hydrogen as the industry ramps up. And I'm going to be talking to Harry Morgan, who's a research analyst with Rethink in the UK, about a recent research note that he wrote showing that uh, the cost of green hydrogen, which is made with uh, renewable energy and uh, water and through it using an electrolyzer, uh, will drop down to $1.50 a kilogram by 2030, and that'll make it competitive with blue hydrogen, which is made from natural gas. So welcome to the interview, Harry. Thanks, Mark. I'm pleased to be here. Now, this is really fascinating. I mean, in Canada, we just had the uh, a German chancellor meeting with uh, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, and they, they struck a, a, an agreement for Canada to supply Germany with uh, hydrogen uh, by about mid-decade. Uh, mid uh, the industry is ramping up all over the world, but cost is the big question. So right now, as I understand it, green hydrogen is in the neighborhood of $6 a kilogram, and blue hydrogen can be anywhere about $1.50 to $2 a kilogram. Have I got that right? Certainly with regard to um, green hydrogen, the prices we see on the market are expensive. And if you're looking at terms of cost of delivery and cost of production combined, you can be up to what, $6 a kilogram. Blue hydrogen, we haven't really seen that much of it produced yet. Um, so, and certainly the, the cost of natural gas is really pushing it up as well. So especially in Europe at the moment, we're seeing 300% increase on natural gas prices. So blue hydrogen, to be honest, we're, we're not we're seeing that produced at around $6, 7 per kilogram as well. Uh, and from our perspective at Ruthic Energy, we're... We're very much pro green hydrogen, uh, blue hydrogen in terms of its methane emissions, its upstream methane emissions, um, and the increase accountability around that, we believe will drive blue hydrogen to be always more expensive than green hydrogen, especially as the green hydrogen market really starts plummeting costs over the next two years, as hopefully we'll get onto throughout, throughout this interview. Well, let's talk about that. Now, you broke the cost of green hydrogen down into capital expenditures, or CapEx, operating expenditures, or OPEX, and then fuel costs. So let's start with CapEx which you estimate now for uh, is about $1,000 to $1,400 per kilowatt, but you expect that to fall quite dramatically down to $340 a kilowatt by 2030. Explain why that uh, that will happen. Yeah, it sounds crazy, doesn't it, when you put it like, when you put it like that? The, um, the reduction of 70 80% in CapEx over sort of 10-year period sounds extreme, extreme, but I mean, it's, it's not far off what we've seen in the solar sector. It's something that especially if you've got these clean energy uh, technologies that can be commodified like electrolyzers can. Uh, it's definitely something we could expect to see. We've also got to bear in mind that electrolyzers are very early in their cost curve. I mean, the global installed capacity at the moment is around 300 megawatts and the project pipeline already is around a thousand times that. So we're going to see a huge amount of capacity come online and the electrolyzer manufacturers are responding to that. So we've seen uh, the report that we released, um, which actually led to this, this, uh, this article was, uh, based around the gigafactories that we're seeing for that. And there's firm, firm announcements around the world now for more than 20 gigawatts of electrolyzer capacity over the next two to three years. And that in itself, some of the companies are expecting to see the cost fall by as much as 75% in terms of their capex. So that's companies like Nell um, for their uh, alkaline electrolyzers. Uh, we believe that with the um, with with the new um, with the new capacity that will be announced in the next few years, we believe that could rise around 100 gigawatts of capacity by 2030. Now, you compared the learning uh, curve uh, for electrolyzers, what you expect, to other technologies. And learning curve is basically, as, uh, a, as the point you make in your note, is that as manufacturing capacity doubles, costs come down by 11% for electrolyzers. Uh, for other clean energy technologies, uh, solar PV, around 23%, lithium-ion batteries, 19%, wind turbines, 15%. So you argue in your note that assuming a learning rate uh, of 11% uh, is quite reasonable. Absolutely. And it's worth noting as well, 11%, this is applied across the entire electrolyzer project as well. So this is including the, um, the stack costs um, and including sort of things like the drying, the cooling, uh, the civil cost, the grid connection. Um, actually, when we're looking at the electrolyzer stack itself, we're looking at a learning rate of around 17%. That sounds high, but it's, it's lower than solar, which has been around 23, up to around 28%, some people estimate, and lithium-ion, which is around 18%. So for electrolyzers, which can be equally be commodified, we're expecting around 17%, and that we're really expecting to drive the cost of those um, electrolyzer stacks down in, uh, in all types of technology within electrolyzers, basically. 
Uh, now, an issue that you didn't uh, address in your research note, Harry, but I'm kind of curious because uh, around electric vehicles and batteries uh, and the battery supply chain, there's a big debate in North America about China's, uh, the way China dominates that industry. And when I think of electric, you know, manufacturing electrolyzers and costs coming down, I wonder, is China going to dominate this industry the way it has others? That's a really interesting question. Um, I think what, one of the things that we've been really, um, we've really built our modeling around uh, everything is the early lead that uh, the US and Europe is taking with this. I mean, if we're looking at the gigafactories that have been announced, ITM Power, Cummins, they're all based in the West, really. And while we are, there are a lot of Chinese manufacturers, Sun, uh, Sun Hu's Zingli being one of those, um, they're very much focused on the domestic market there. Uh, and actually producing that great green hydrogen market in China actually has a lot of cost benefit there. So we're not expecting to see a huge amount exported into global markets until we've satisfied their own domestic demand, uh, which is largely going to be used to actually replace high cost natural gas in that market. We're actually going to import a lot of natural gas. So the early lead has been taken by, um, by Western OEMs, especially in PEM technologies. But yeah, it, maintaining that lead will, re will really rely on building out this economy to scale as quickly as possible. Now, speaking from a Canadian point of view, because we, while we have a manufacturing sector, it's not anywhere near the size of the U.S. or uh, some of the European countries. Uh, but let's say that Canada, because it does, it, it's already planning uh, uh, to build out hyd green hydrogen, uh, wants to be an early player in this game. Uh, is there opportunity for a country like Canada, which stimulates the, the uh, production of green hydrogen for its domestic market, maybe some export market, to actually work with the OEMs to establish manufacturing capacity and a supply chain as well. Absolutely. And I think this country like Canada are in a really prime opportunity to benefit off this market. So obviously in Canada, you've got a grid that's very green by Western standards. You've got a lot of renewable energy. Um, being able to push beyond that and use that the excess renewable energy you've got at, at times of the day where you're generating excess, uh, to produce green hydrogen provides a huge chance for export. In fact, what we've been working on uh, over the past couple of weeks at Rethink has been the cost of actually importing that hydrogen into Europe from Canada. So while you'll be, um, we'll see a lot of these OEMs set up supply chains in Canada and places like Canada, a lot of this hydrogen produced actually will be exported into markets that are really demand heavy and don't necessarily have that capacity to build out renewables. So Europe being a particular uh, example there. Well, let's talk about operating expenditures. Now, this is a, a fairly uh, small percentage of an electrolyzer cost or the cost of producing a kilogram of, of hydrogen. What can you tell us about OPEX? So OPEX, much like the, um, the sort of balance of plant costs we're expecting to see in electrolyzers, they are a much smaller uh, section of, of the overall cost of production, um, although we expect to see that that proportion increase as the capex of the electrolyzer stack itself comes down. So things like that are to do with the stack replacement costs um, and, di and different things around that. So things like servicing your labor as well. Uh, obviously those are expected to stay, they're expected to decrease. I mean, we expect to see those pulled by around sort of 40 to 50%. Uh, last year's things like uh, grid connection issues are, are removed by, by sort of the decentralization of these projects, actually pairing them directly with renewable energy plants. Um, but they, there is much less scope for them to fall. So while they account for around 1% to 2% of uh, CapEx on an annual basis at the moment, we're expecting to see that to rise around between 5 and 10%, um, most likely around 6% is what we're, in, we're anticipating within uh, the OPEX. Now, what about the third one? Uh, we'll call it fuel cost, but really we're talking about uh, electricity and, and water. Uh, what about those costs? So for uh, hydrogen to be green, um, to a certain extent, it has to be renewable electricity. Obviously, that has the benefit of the fact that that's already the lowest cost of power in most markets now. So that's the real advantage we have there. Obviously, the difficulty is uh, the load factor. So while we're expecting load factors of between 20%, we're expecting that to rise around 30% as we see more hybrid wind and solar projects powering electrolyzers. Uh, and more of those, including a bit of battery storage as well. So you've got less disruptive supply. We believe we're being really conservative with this as well. I think a lot of these projects will have 100% load factors or close to 100% load factors with long-term PPAs signed with, co with companies that have managed to develop really strong solar plus renewables projects or wind plus, uh, wind plus storage projects even. Um, so the cost of this fuel supply in markets where we're expecting to see most of the hydrogen produced, so it's largely in sort of North Africa for, for Europe as well, Costs are around sort of $30 per megawatt hour is what we're expecting to see. And those are very much within what we expect 
to actually drive those prices down to $1.50 per kilogram by 2030. The cost of water is another fuel cost really there, but again, that's a, it's probably a, it's a slightly smaller chunk um, of that overall cost and um, will be fairly flat as well. So that that is sort of an underlying cost that will maintain the cost at, at, at around $1.50. Now, uh, water, you uh, peg water as being about uh, 22 cents per kilogram by in 2030. It's 14% of your of the total cost. And I'm wondering, given the, you know, we're seeing droughts uh, all over the world. And uh, to what extent will droughts and, and uh, water supply determine where hydrogen uh, production facilities set up? Yeah, it's a huge issue. And it's, it's for certainly when we're looking at visiting North Africa as um, hydrogen hubs, that's where we've really got an issue there. And there is obviously uh, a lot of focus around distributing water to that, any, that those parts of the world anyway. Um, I think one of the areas we expect to see huge advances made in the next few years is within desalination and also within the use of salt water in electrolysis. So I think that's a real area of focus. Uh, no one knows exactly how it's going to be solved yet, but I think that, I think it will be solved. It seems to be an engineering barrier from our perspective. And that certainly we expect to see maintain the cost of water, potentially even see it fall if we can suddenly use salt water in electrolysis. So that, um, but certainly the, the, the cause of drought obviously is, is a concern within electrolysis as it is with the renewable power. And many, many countries are very dependent on hydropower um, for their electricity as well. In, in a country like Canada, the, which has uh, enormous supplies of fresh water uh, in, in its lake systems and its and glaciers, uh, what does that give Canada a competitive advantage? Being having a, a, a you know fairly uh, constant supply of water. Certainly, yeah, and I think that's it's a real strength as well. I think the, the ability of Canada to be able to harness uh, hydropower resources as well is a real strength. So obviously, those have a much higher load factor than the typical solar farm or your wind farm. So that's a real benefit then if you're trying to power electrolyze off that and actually driving those costs down. Again, it is very associated to the actual costs of those renewable, re renewable energy plants. And the actual cost of the renewable electricity, we anticipate would be around three quarters of the total cost of hydrogen by around 2030. So it's, it's hugely important is that is that fuel cost. Uh, and Canada, I, I believe personally, will have a real advantage. And I think that's why we're seeing interest from the light of, like of, lights of Germany in terms of actually uh, resourcing the hydrogen as imports from Canada. Now, one final question, Harry. Uh, you you uh, are estimating that the electricity will be supplied in long-term power purchase agreements, which then gives the uh, hydrogen production plant the advantage of knowing what its uh, what its fuel costs are going to be. But to what extent is is uh, 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 the marginal cost of solar? So we see in California, the, you know, they, they curtail solar at some times because there's so much of it. The marginal cost approaches zero uh, at other times. Uh, is that something that a hydro, uh, you know, an electrolyzer and a hydrogen plant, a green hydrogen plant, can take advantage of? Absolutely, and I think that's something that um, we're very much yet to see used in the market. I mean, the electricity market is really undesigned for harnessing these curtail this curtailment yet. Uh, obviously, at the moment, the closest we've got to that is actually storing up lithium-ion batteries. But as soon as we've got hydrogen facilities there, then that will obviously be used to drive down the cost of green hydrogen. I think one of the approaches that we'll likely see is these long-term PPAs that we've talked about being used for pass through a project generation. So maybe become 50, 60 percent, similar to the sort of capacity market with making sure the capacity is available there, ready for when the uh, ready so that enough hydrogen can be produced at a, a lower load factor, especially when, if you're using. PEM electrolyzers, for example, are very good at uh, scaling up and down depending on the actual power going into the project. Uh, I also think that once we've got this, this level of curtailment, that's when that extra power comes in pretty much at zero cost. And that's when you start to see production rates increase and the cost of hydrogen fall through the floor. Harry, uh, very really appreciate your insights. Thank you very much for this. Thanks, Markham.